Um, I think it's about time, so let's get started. Um, this talk is going to be about using Django in production with Twitter Pecs. And before, I guess first a little bit about me. Um, as you can tell from my shirt, I've given a talk at PyOhio before. I was here last year. Uh, I've been a software engineer and a DevOps engineer in the past. I am currently a senior DevOps engineer at Nimbus Services, Inc. Um, we are hiring, and we're one of the sponsors of PyOhio. So if you like the content of the talk and you'd like to do this kind of uh, work as your day job, uh, maybe reach out to us. Before we get into the actual content, um, there's sort of two topics that I hope some of you are at least a little bit familiar with. Uh, the first one is using Python packaging tools like virtualenv. And the other one is, um, they didn't even hear the end. <laughs> and the other one is uh, using the Django web framework. So if you're not familiar with those, then I would recommend maybe reading up on them a little bit and coming back and watching, and coming back and watching the, uh, the video after the fact. So if not, I hope you get something out of this. All right, so a high level overview of what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, first, we're gonna compare uh, some common packaging tools, virtual env versus uh, Twitter pecs. Then we'll be talking about how to integrate a Django web application with Twitter pecs. Uh, then we'll talk about how to get the output of the build tool into production and use it. And lastly, some extra topics that you might find interesting, depending on what you're doing. All right, so a pretty common way to get your Python web applications into production is by building a virtual env. Uh, and what I typically see happen is on the actual server that you want to run the app on, you'll create a virtual environment, you'll install your requirements through maybe a requirements.txt file, uh, and then you'll install your application using maybe Python setup.py install, or if you're like really fancy, you have your own internal uh, package server and you'll download it and install it from there. Um, there is a number of reasons why this is not an ideal workflow. So one of them is uh, virtual environments are not really portable. Wherever you build it is kind of where it has to stay. Now, there are scripts I've seen posted on the internet that like try to use find and set and awk to change all of the relevant paths inside of a virtual environment so that you can move it. And having written one of those scripts myself, um, I'm here to tell you that is not a good idea. You are, uh, you're playing with fire. You know, it's not really designed to do that. And eventually they change the standard or they change the way that setup tools works or whatever, and that's gonna break on you. Uh, and of course, moving it between machines is a whole nother thing. Uh, so, which kind of brings me to the next topic. You know, a lot of Python packages have C extensions. So when you're installing these packages in your virtual environment, typically you'll be building some C extensions for them. Maybe you're using like Psycop G2 to talk to Postgres. You need to have development tools installed, at least the compiler, make, probably some other ones, um, header files, libraries, whatever you need to build the C extensions for that machine. Uh, and that's, maybe sometimes that's okay, but sometimes that's not so great. Maybe you're trying to keep uh, the image that you're working with as small as possible. Maybe you want this to be a Docker container, right? And you don't want to have to come back later and try to remove all of the development tools that you've installed, um, or other reasons. And lastly, whatever you install in the virtual environment, your end users, your, the DevOps guys, whoever ends up using your production and your application of production, um, they can use any of the tools you install and they can access any of the packages you install. And sometimes that's okay, but you know, ideally if you're trying to limit what someone can do with your application in production, probably the correct way to do it is by giving them security credentials that only do what it is they're supposed to be able to do, right? But another way that you can sort of do security uh, in layers is by restricting what commands they can run in production. And there really isn't a very good way to do that with a virtual environment. If I install Gunicorn and there's like one specific way to run Gunicorn correctly for my app in production, I can tell you that, but you can go and run the Gunicorn script however you want, right? So these are some of the reasons why virtual environments are not necessarily the best tool for the job. So let's look at uh, one alternative. So uh, Twitter released this tool, uh, I think like six or seven years ago, called Twitter Pex, and I, I guess it does stand for something. I think someone asked me that. It's a uh, Python executable. And the gist of it is that it takes um, all of your application's requirements, including your application, packages them into a zip file, and then stores a script with that zip file that you can run when you actually run the file itself. So the file itself will be executable, and when you run it, whatever script you've chosen as your entry point 
will uh, run and, and take over and have access to all of your packages. There are some advantages to this over virtual environments. So first of all, the output is a single file. It's a .pex file, but it's, it's basically a zip file. And it's a lot easier to move that around, not only you know, within one machine, but between different machines. Uh, which kind of brings me to the next point. There are no external dependencies except for a matching Python interpreter version. So if you use Python 3.6 to build this PEX file, then you need to have Python 3.6 to run it. 3.6.3, 3.6.4, it doesn't matter. It needs to be some version of 3.6. You wouldn't be able to run it, for example, with uh, 3.7 or 3.5, um, which could be a big deal depending on your situation if you're trying to get something that you've built on the latest Ubuntu when you're trying to run it on like CentOS 5 or something. You might have some difficulties, but it's pretty straightforward, if necessary, to download, build, and install Python from source. So this is not as big of a deal um, in terms of external dependencies. Uh, and lastly, there's a single entry point. So when you build it, you tell it, this is the script I want you to use um, when someone runs this zip file. And you can control what that script is. You can control what commands can be run through it and how your end users interact with your application. So let's do a quick demo of how PEX works. Um, I am inside a virtual environment, and so you can install it through pip. I've already installed it here uh, in advance of this. One way to use it is to create sort of um, temporary environments on the fly that have some packages pre-installed in them. So maybe I want to use the request library, but I don't really want to install it for whatever reason. On my local machine, I, I don't know. I don't want to use virtual info at all or something. Um, I can call PEX like this and then use the request library. I really hope whoever runs example.com. Do they? Well, I'm breaking all the rules. <laughs> um, so a much more useful way to use it is to actually save that environment that it builds to a PEX file and then run it again later. So maybe I want to use the YouTube-DL script uh, for whatever reason to download some files. And um, so I'm installing the YouTube-DL package. I'm telling it to save the output file to YouTube.pex. And I am telling it to choose the entry point script as the YouTube-DL script. And so uh, you know, if I run this, it has the same exact options that YouTube-DL would have. Uh, the way this works is it actually unpacks itself into a temporary location somewhere on your disk. Uh, and then it runs your entry script. So at the end of the day, it looks very similar, you know, if you're actually looking at the way it's running on, like on disk in memory or whatever. Uh, but until you run it, it's, it's a single file. Uh, if you wanted to package a web application, you would have to pass a few more parameters. So this is a pretty typical command line that I would use to package a Django web app. Um, dash v is the path to the directory that contains the setup.py file for my web app. Dash R is my requirements file. I'm disabling caching. Uh, let me pull that up here. I'm disabling caching because for some reason I have weird cache related issues on my machine. Uh, I'm setting the entry point script, which I'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, I'm saving it to a .pex file. So I'll run this right now. And it's going to download my requirements.txt. Uh, at some point, you'll see it scrolling by. It's going to do, yeah, set entry point to console script. And now if I run this, you might recognize that as the beginning of the output of you know what Django manage.py looks like. So that's sort of a quick demo of how PEX works. Let's talk about how to use this with a Django web application to get it into production easily. So there's really two things you have to consider. Uh, the first one is the entry point script. You can pick whatever you want. It doesn't have to be a Python script. It could be a shell script. It has to be a file that would be included in a source distribution of your Python package or installed onto the machine when installing the Python package. Um, you know, when you create a, a default Django application, it creates a top-level manage.py script for you that you can use to interact with it. And since this is a web application, I think that script makes the most sense as the entry point. It already has the majority of the functionality we're interested in, running database migrations, you know, all the things you would do with a, a Django web app. 
Uh, one caveat is, you know, you have to move it from the top level into one of your Python packages, and then you have to modify your setup.py file to actually uh, have it as an entry point. So for example, here is my setup.py file. And there's some boilerplate here. We don't really care about this, but you know, the name, version, description. But at the bottom here, you see that that front desk script, it's actually importing front desk.manage and calling the main method. And that looks like, like this, which is 90% identical to the manage.py script. All I've done is take the actual code and moved it from the if name equals main into a main function so that I can import it instead of having, having it run right away. The other thing you have to think about are what other management commands might I want? So, you know, Django gives you some out of the box, but in addition to those, you might want to do things like run a web server. Um, in production, a pretty common choice is Gunicorn. Uh, or you might want to do something like run uh, a Celery task worker, it, you know, for running asynchronous tasks in the background for your web app. So you might want to do other things. These are probably the most common, I would say, for Django web applications. So I've gone ahead and made demos of both of these. And uh, let me show you right now what Celery looks like. Okay, so when you add a new management command to Django, what you really do is you inherit from this base command class. And then you fill in some functionality in two or three different methods. Uh, this does nothing. I don't know why I left this in here. <laughs> Just put pass. Add arguments doesn't do anything. Handle is what actually runs your command. And so what I did was I opened up the Celery script. And I noticed that what it was doing was actually importing this main function. And so what I'm doing is I'm importing the main function and I'm calling it. The only difference is I'm overriding uh, the contents of sys.argv. That's what that parameter is. And that's because the celery main function expects your command to start with celery, and instead it would start with front desk run underscore celery. So I'm kind of faking it. But, you know, this is exactly the command you'd use on the command line. And now what I can do is So these are just the uh, command line parameters that Django uh, creates for me. But if I run it, you can see it's running Celery. This is what the output would normally look like. And as a matter of fact, there's some tasks there that I have defined that it's picking up on. So Celery is kind of like a very, uh, very high level integration, but a more in-depth one would be running Gunicorn. With Gunicorn, I was able to actually look at the packages that they have and the way they're built and figure out how to use their classes to export the majority of their command line arguments that you would normally have access to in the Gunicorn script into my management command. And so that's what I'm doing right here. I have a, an arg parse instance, an argument parser instance passed in, and I'm adding some keys based on uh, Gunicorn classes. You'll notice I'm also removing some keys. These are parameters or, or co command line flags that Gunicorn lets you set that I don't actually want my end users to ever use. And I have some comments there, but basically, you know, I wouldn't want you to ever change the Python path because I know what I, what I want is my Python path when running my web app. And I don't want you to ever use the daemon flag. Uh, I'll show you an example of why in a minute. Um, you know, so these are, these are examples of that. So for example, Okay, so we have a lot of command line arguments. <laughs> and some of these are from Django, but the majority of them, like worker connections, threads, max requests, these are the exact same command line arguments you would have access to if you were running the Gunicorn script. Um, and if I run it, you can see it starts Gunicorn. So, those are examples of two of the common management commands you might want to define in addition to what Django ships with. All right, the last part of this is how do we get this into production? I have my PEX file, you know, I want to go run it on a server somewhere. Um, well, there's a number of things to consider, but probably the two biggest ones for Django specifically are how do I get my settings in there? Uh, and how do I run the run web or the run worker commands as uh, long lived processes, as daemons? Uh, I'm a huge fan of the 12-factor application guidelines, which if you're not familiar with them, it's just like a set of guidelines for how to develop web applications and follow best practices while doing it. 
And uh, one of the things they tell you is that you should pass in your settings as environment variables. This is also what the Django tutorial recommends. So what I do is I use systemd in production. And oh, whoops. Got a little excited there. Uh, these passwords aren't important. So, um, And I create an environment file, which looks like this. So these are all environment settings. And before my commands are run, systemd will load this file, set these environment variables, and export them for my commands to have access to. And of course, in my Django settings files, I, I read out of the environment variables uh, to get them. And speaking of which, you know, how do you run these commands as services? Well, if you're already using something like systemd, you could write a service file. This is what it looks like for the web server. Uh, I'm not going to get into systemd service files because maybe you're using another init system or something, but um, type equals simple tells systemd that this command will not fork. It will run in the foreground, which, if you remember from earlier, is why I didn't want anyone to ever run it with the daemon flag. So that's one example of how having a single entry point that you control really gives you the ability to say, you know, it never makes sense to run it in production this way. And I'm going to go ahead and just remove that ability. Um, environment file is the file I showed you earlier. Canonical path is uh, Etsy default. And this is the command I'm running. And I'm running it through bash because I want to be able to template uh, the path to the pex file. Makes it very easy to swap out which version of the app I'm running in production without having to modify the systemd service files. And that's kind of a, the gist of it. I'm going to show you a demo of some things in a second here. But um, some other topics you might think about are extra Django management commands. You know, it ships with a lot of useful ones, like migrate to do database migrations. But it also has a DB shell, which gives you a database console to whatever database you've configured for the Django ORM. Or a shell, which gives you a Python interpreter where the Python path is set up correctly so that you can import your Django models, views, um, tasks, whatever. Um, you know, it might be the case that you want to give your developers the ability to run some sort of debugging commands in production, you know, but you don't want them to be able to do anything. You want to very explicitly specify you can run this command under these situations. Well, you can control who has access to these management commands through your entry point script, and you can rely on the fact that all of the logic you have in your Django settings files and everywhere else is going to be run as part of running these commands. Um, let me show you, this isn't a very long talk, but I can demo a quick example of how you might use this in production to do some debugging. This is a, uh, a web server I spun up earlier today just to run this as, a, as an example. And I have, I have some, some stuff on it. <laughs> I have a PEX file, which is built using that command I showed you earlier for uh, my Django web application. Um, I have a deploy script that's not very interesting, but I have this shell script right here, which unfortunately this vim doesn't have my color scheme, so this might be hard to see. Maybe not. And what it does is it loads the environment file, it exports a few uh, environment variables, and then it runs the pex file with whatever command line uh, flags you pass to the script. So I can do something like Oh, whoops. Right. It's USPS, right? <laughs> so this is, you know, pretty typical how you would go about working with models in Django. Um, and uh, if I had a web browser, which I think I full screen this. How do I get out of that? No, that's not it. Do you know? Command shift F? That's hilarious. Yeah, Apple tab will work. You know, so there's my, my package that I created. This is just the web app I have. It's very simple um, running. So that, you know, that's an example of how, uh, how do I get back? Wow, I'm actually really impressed with that. <laughs> Yeah. So that's an example of how you would take a web Django web application, package it as a PEX file, get it into production, run it in production, and then use the PEX file to do debugging and other you know, shenanigans. Um, 
that is, did I break this? No, okay, that is kind of, uh, kind of it for what I have here. Um, if you want to see some reference links, if you want to see the files that I showed you, if you want to see the scripts that I didn't quite go into in very much detail, this is the GitHub repository where they're stored. There's a little bit more to it in there. Uh, it's kind of a demo for how to do rolling deploys with zero downtime in production using AWS and a Django web app. And now, and now you know Twitter pecs. <laughs> um, if you have any questions I don't get to today, I think I have five minutes. I don't know if I have enough time for that. Okay. So I can take some questions now, but if not, you can contact me at my personal email address, or if you're interested in possibly working at Nimbus, um, you can use the official email address on our website, or you can contact me at that one. So I can take a question or two if anyone has anything. Uh, what's, um, what's the license on text? And it just uses zip file, like encoding to press, right? So the question was, first, what is the license? And second, it just uses uh, zip file encoding to compress the contents of it. Um, I don't know what the license is, to be honest. I do know that it's not prohibitive to using it uh, for, what's the word I'm looking for here? Commercial? Yes, commercial uses. Um, the second question was, does it use zip file encoding? Yeah, so actually the Python interpreter has built-in support for running Python scripts inside of zip files. And that's kind of what PEX takes advantage of. Um, that .pex file I had earlier is just a zip file. So yes, I don't know exactly if it calls like the, the zip utility and what flags it passes to it, but it is just a zip file. You could un unzip it. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question was, can I briefly review the multiple points of entry thing? So as an example, I'm in a virtual environment right now, and I have installed all of my app's requirements into this virtual environment. And so naturally, I have access to the, oh, yeah, I, I forget that it's at the bottom. I have access to the Gunicorn script, because Gunicorn is the web server that I'm using. Um, but this means that like, if this was production, I could now go ahead and call Gunicorn with whatever flags I wanted to in any way I wanted to. Yeah, on the, on, on the other side of it is if you're using Twitter pecs, I don't have access to the Gunicorn script. I only have access to the one entry point script that the person who built it has specified. And so in this case, it would be uh, example.pex. So, you know, one difference is The Gunicorn script allows you to run it as a daemon. The my pex file with my Django management command does not. That was one of the command line uh, flags that I sort of omitted. It's a kind of a contrived example because it's not the end of the world if you did. It just wouldn't work well with system D. But you know you could do this with other things. You could say I'm installing a command line client for Postgres or whatever, and I really only want you to ever run it with these flags in production. Um, I don't know how much time we have. I actually don't have a clock on here, so. Okay, anyone else have any other questions? No? Fantastic.